This is uh, welcome to the panel on the uh, future of 3D. And what we're going to do is uh, we have a distinguished panel of uh, discussants who I'll introduce in a, in a moment. But what we're going to do after we get things rolling is ignore our distinguished panel and pass around a microphone to uh, all you guys in the audience. Or you can uh, write questions on, please feel free to write questions or on a piece of paper and pass them up to me and we'll uh, pass that way or we'll, we'll figure it out. But. So um, in our, on our panel we have uh, Christophe Mouton from uh, EDF, Mike Arito from some hospital out in San Francisco. <laughs> He actually saves real lives and why he's doing this. It's like saving them. <laughs> uh, Dieter Fellner from Fraunhofer, who we all know. And uh, uh, Nick Pollies from uh, Virginia Tech. Not the University of Virginia. I actually remember this time. I always confuse these things. <laughs> so what we're going to, uh, I'm going to just start off and moderate. Hopefully I'm going to not talk much at all. Um, <laughs> But I think it, it would be interesting to hear it. So this, this, the, the rage and fashion these days is VR. So uh, I would like to, to hear uh, what these guys think about sort of the, not so much the, the future of VR, but also the future of web VR and what's the relationship, let's say, between, how would you, how would you compare and contrast uh, sort of standalone VR with web VR and or what is the significance of these things and what what role do you think standards may play? We'll, we'll just go from there. So <laughs> that's a really good picture. Uh, we'll we'll start with uh, why don't we start with either Christopher or Nick, who, who one end or the other wants to. Uh, Christoph is looking. <laughs> uh, <laughs> let, let's go with Nick. <clears throat> okay. Oh, thank you. So, um, yeah, VR. Uh, you know, um, a lot of things have been, uh, it's been interesting to watch um, from afar, uh, in, in my opinion. You know, the, uh, all of the hype and excitement around uh, VR devices again. Um, and while I don't see um, really any fundamental change with the head mounted display of today and the one that was around 20 years ago, um, a lot of the same issues are there, um, latency and uh, focal depth and things like this, uh, resolution. But uh, the best part I think about it is that, that I've really enjoyed this kind of turn the corner is those systems used to be, you know, $25,000 or something like that. And now we've got all of this equipment, these sensors, these displays for 500 bucks, 1,000 bucks. We're sort of back into the era of um, garage tinkering, you know? You can buy a couple of devices and hack something together with some haptic force feedback or a leap uh, motion. Um, the kinds of things that we can do, kind of tinkering again in the garage, uh, garage VR, is, <clears throat> is really exciting to me and it's something that uh, certainly my students um, get excited about. So I think, I think that's uh, a big game changer, uh, is just really the price point. Um, I don't, I'm not sure if I want to uh, weigh in on how long uh, Oculus's products or these different ones will last, um, but uh, I think the exciting part is that at least they're accessible for people to play with and uh, to tinker with. So. Well, well, I think there's sort of, uh you know, to paraphrase the sort of, uh, what's the best camera, the one that's always with you, I think it's like, what's the best VR device, it's the one that's with you, turns out to also still be your camera, because people are shoving cameras and pieces of cardboard, and it's like, mm. it's kind of a, makes it totally ubiquitous. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's, uh, uh, it's very hard so to add anything, from at least from my point, what Nick has not already said. Uh, the opportunity with uh, this new wave with a lot more attention because sort of companies we all know suddenly have been shown have shown their interest in, in, in VR um, from the applications and application domains we all know I think um, I'm quite doubtful that people suddenly sort of have an Oculus Rift <coughs> in their head. Um, it's, uh, it, 
uh, ruins your hair, uh, so sort of the way they've been done, so we have a large part of our population. Uh, you know, I, I, not I accepting had that problem. <laughs> <laughs> but, but believe me, there are others coming from. Uh, uh, so you have um, a minister in, and uh, you tell her sort of to put that device on. It's quite unlikely that there will be pictures um, from her with, with an Oculus Rift in front of her head. Uh, and the hair completely destroyed. So this is, uh, that's, uh, I think we have a problem here in, 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 in the sheer acceptance. In addition to sort of being locked in a, de in a device, well, I'm, I think I'm preaching to the converted, you, you all know the problems. Um, the attention and the opportunity with low-cost devices that something comes up we, we none of us really thought about. That's there, so that's the plus. Right? Yeah. Um everything else they said, but um, obviously Oculus is focusing on the gaming industry and gamers don't mind looking silly when they do. And that, that's gonna, that will at least as, you know, in the past gaming has um, pushed the technology, I think that it will push it again and will disseminate throughout. And as Sandy said, I really think, I mean, the reason John Carmack, as you all know who he is, uh, joined um, Oculus is because he, he was interested in the potential of VR uh, mobile VR, which is why they have that uh, partnership with Samsung. Um, and I think eventually what's going to happen is because of this push and because of that $2 billion impetus from Facebook to get this whole, to sort of kickstart this whole virtual reality industry again, there are going to be uh, significant design iterations so that these head mount displays, which make you look like aliens, like Peter said, are going to uh, eventually be just glasses with people wear. And then it'll be a lot more socially acceptable uh, to be immersed. And of course, along with the virtual reality track, there's also the augmented reality track, where I think we'll see a lot of that coming with the glasses now with Microsoft's Holo lens and um, the um, Magic Leap, uh, the Google, which has been half a billion dollars funded through Google at that in at Southern California. So, um, you know, we're going to see a lot of playing those things and I think that will that will sort of drive the technology to make it more easily wearable and socially acceptable. Thanks. So um, I think that uh, what we live today, what we experience with uh, this new trend, this new um, very um, girly trend uh, about what we are, we are and uh, what we see about Oculus, especially, um, I think it's time to to speak a little bit about sustainable VR, because uh, when I start in the end of the 90s to study VR, uh, I see very nice demo. It was also a mounted display, as you said. It was not so new, as you said, Nick. What we see today, and um, I would say that uh, sustainable VR could be something that could be last in the. 10, 20 next year. And uh, what I have retained from our past experience uh, in the 90s, it was uh, the content itself, because it was written in VR. The rest, the hardware, it was uh, garbage. Uh, everything has changed, and only the content is still there. So, and even the software, it's interesting to know that, even the software disappeared, because it was uh, end of the 90s, and it was for the hardware, for the operating system, for the way to, to develop and programming. And uh, yeah, the content, the content itself was written in VR. Yes. And today we can read it again. So the question behind all this trend is, uh, OK, we can spend again, uh, like end of the 90s, billions of euros, dollars, whatever you want. But uh, yeah, sustainability could be interesting too, sometimes, in the concept and uh, also in the data itself. So that's my point in terms of nuclear energy. Cool, yeah, and, and to EDF, yeah. did you guys um, experiment with VR in the context of large plants? Or For training purposes, uh, we have made a very um, successful experience, yeah, experiments. Uh, today, uh, we are still working on how we can deploy uh, the model itself on a web based uh, for publishing. It's what we, during this last day, we have presented all this work with uh, our colleagues from Florida. 
I did. And uh, it would be, I will say, uh, yeah, it's not uh, immersive, but uh, uh, being able to access the 3D mockup itself, it's a huge step for, for our company. Yeah. It sounds like another um, uh, case to be made for distributing uh, the information via the web, also. Well, so you, you asked a couple questions, and we didn't really um, talk about the web, the web distribution of VR, because you did throw a web VR in there, so I don't know if you want us to. Sure. I mean, I think that, you know, when it comes to that, that's where I think it's new, that, that's something that's different, other than this, this, this second coming of virtual reality, I think where we actually can now deliver it through a web browser, which is a real excellent delivery mechanism for the masses, besides being able to put it on, you know, these things, to be able to put it in sort of a, a generic uh, framework that is sort of available to, uh, in a cross-platform way. I think that that's, that's different, and that, to me, that's, that's really, really exciting about this. You know? Also, I think, I think uh, not to, to those that attended the web VR thing yesterday, it's a little bit of a repetition, but I know, uh, for me, the, personally, the thing that sort of grabbed me again, that I thought that making VR real again, was uh, image-based stuff, video, because that really didn't exist in the 90s. The first round of VR, it was all synthetic, pretty much synthetic computer graphics. Um, and now, you know, there was a demo of Paul McCartney and I was able to be on stage. I turned my head to the left and he's sitting there playing and then to the right was the drums and that's like really cool. And I think it's very compelling. And you see, I know Oculus has even something called Oculus Studio and I think a number of the other vendors are sort of starting content studios. So I, I, would, I don't know how successful film Film in uh, 360 will be, but it requires another language, I'm sure. Also, um, if anybody, anybody in the audience have a compelling desire to speak, yes, of course you do. Aren't you tired of hearing us talk? <laughs> Maybe you. <laughs> okay, why don't we why don't we switch to a different area? Um, uh, as far as applications, a sort of an, an additional uh, area where there's a lot of uh, quote unquote disruption happening now is 3D printing. And there is somewhat of a relationship between uh, the 3D standards that the consortium deals with and printing. Um, but there's also, I think, a lot of other uh, areas of work that we can get into in dealing with things like printing properties. And there's a lot of different types of uh, 3D printing uh, equipment that's coming to market and it's becoming cheap enough to have at your home with maker bots and, and other more advanced devices. What do you guys think about sort of the, the, the realization side, the making things real at home? Where is that going in the uh, future? Nick? You just talk to me. Well, um, this is a really exciting uh, piece of the story. Um, I don't know if many folks are aware, um, but much of the uh, online printing manufacturers are already uh, today, you know, using X3D in some form in the back end. And I'm thinking of the NIH 3D Print Exchange, uh, which is you know an enterprise uh, and community site. Um, basically, with doing all kinds of validation, transcoding for everything from, you know, molecules from the protein database to prosthetic hands for people. Um, these are these are real um, objects. They get printed. You can click. I printed this. Um, all of the many of the companies are supporting it now. So I think. Um, uh, you know, we need to step, the materials thing is something interesting, but I think, uh, you know, wondering about um, how we, how we should represent some things that are more like um, animation or something like, so for a hinge to work a certain way that you would want to print. I think there's functional components that will be coming next, maybe more than just uh, a shape uh, or a bust of, of the president's head. Um, but that's, I think, the probably the next step um, is is what can you do with with a three D printed thing? It's not just a static thing. Um, so I think that's where I would look for the next. 
Leicester. Well, I think in the context of the of a Web 3D conference, we see how, how important um, this overall workflow is because, um, of course, MakerBot uh, for uh, for the geek can be used at home, and uh, it's quite helpful. I'm not really convinced that sort of 3D printers will massively show up in in, in private homes. I'm more prepared to believe that, uh, like coffee shops, sort of we will see sort of those devices come up. And, and then sort of here is this, this internet component, sort of an, a really core cool component of the whole thing. Um, we see editing system or sort of, we might actually again, like sort of quoting this device again, with um, uh, simple cell phones, 3D acquisition based on multi-view stereo, for example, is already reality. So if you can do that, you can quickly acquire 3D equipment. Uh, once uh, 3D uh, object retrieval works, uh, the way it should, so that we might be able so to look for particular, that particular device, at least from the outside, it looks exactly that the replacement piece I need uh, to go to the beta database of, of particular providers and suppliers and then order that piece. And I think it will affect logistics in a way that uh, rather than sort of storing those things in case somebody wants it, so that you typically produce it in time when it's being demanded and you see uh, Shapeways and many others sort of already providing that, you pick the material, you pick the quality, and uh, if you, um, if we only do a little bit uh, uh, extrapolation on the on the quality of um, selective laser melting with various materials, then it's clear that that even sturdy replacement parts can be can be printed. Print costs are still prohibitively high, uh, so it's uh, this building everything from scratch uh, and with fairly long time because of course selective laser melting is is, is done at 80 micrometer resolution for the voxel. Um, and and uh, the, the trend sort of is even going at, at higher resolutions, but then it takes almost forever sort of to build a substantial piece, right? So th there is there is this trade-off between very fine resolution and and uh, long printing time. So uh, I think from the trend, what we what we might be seeing uh, soon coming from the research side and then eventually mi migrating into the production side is that uh, sort of rough prototypes will be mass produced and then serve as the, the material where you print on, so sort of early early developments already to be seen, and and then again, sort of it's a it's an algorithmic question, sort of what is the best prototype to print on, <coughs> but this is not the end user's problem. The end user sort of might combine this 3D acquisition with the retrieval to find the proper object, and then basically sort of ship the task off to a, a company, and this company will pick the closest print site and then ship it, <coughs> ship it back to you, or you pick it up. Uh, so there, at several stages, I think a community like this is, is uh, will play a relevant role. Uh, some of the standards are already there. I did address the color issue. I think there is still work to be done, and I hope that this community will actually jump into that area and into that domain. Um, and uh, because <coughs> otherwise, others might do it. And I would personally consider this unfair because sort of the Web 3D community has done great work over the past two years, two decades and uh, should go on doing so, and rather than sort of being squashed in a very small corner, because many of the problems, we can tick them off, we've done it. Um, and um, maybe a community or also to sustain sort of new wide fields for research to be done for the next generation of research coming in. Um, but we should seriously sort of have a look at uh, what about 3D object retrieval, sort of to bring maybe those communities together uh, with the Web 3D issues, searching and indexing, another issue of only brief of touch. Indexing is an issue which is tightly coupled with the representation of the information we have on one hand, and the other hand sort of with the search and retrieval we do, um, and, and then sort of generating links to existing information. So sort of all bringing all that together, even though we started off with the printing, I think all those things are, are intrinsically linked very closely together. Yeah, and certainly all, all the different kinds of searching, you know, there's image-based, you know, you see a little bit from, uh, I think, Apple, and it has, a, you know, the ability to search for, like, faces, similar faces. I think Google's got some color searching on their, uh, in, the, in their general searches, but um, uh, the ability, like you sort of made the point yesterday, right now it's really not an issue because the objects that exist are generally have lots of tags, lots of meta tags, but once uh, we have lots of 3D objects that are just exist in some unstructured database, 
the ability to do uh, shape searching will become critical. Otherwise, you know, we won't be able to find anything. Well, well in, in addition to that, imagine sort of a piece of whatever kind of device at home is broken. Uh, you wouldn't know sort of what kind of proper right. metadata you would need right. to search for that thing. Exactly. It's, exactly. It's, it's the visual retrieval you would typically do. This is the broken bar that can actually put it together, or maybe I scan both broken parts and, and assemble them on my computer and then use it as a search term. You don't know sort of what's the name or ID number of your dishwasher you bought 10 years ago. Right, now so that <coughs> reminds me of you know, the ability to, like you were saying, have the objects that uh, if, I, if I'm in a store and I don't want to keep a lot of inventory, I want to print the objects sort of on demand. It's really the, it's the Star Trek replicator sort of coming to life, really. And, and it's, uh, it's not too far away. Mike? So um, as far as the standards go, yeah, I, I think that this community actually has already worked on a lot of, some of the, for a lot of the problems that uh, are demanded by 3D printing. And, there, I think there already is a, a, another group that's trying to, a, a Microsoft has led an industry consortium, I think they have something called 3MF or something, which is, is now, like you said, they're, they're, someone's gonna try and do it, they're doing it already, I think. really bad actor. So, yeah, something like that. So, yeah, I, and I think that this community actually has the experience and, and to be able to contribute to that in a better way and in a more consensus space, and that, that seems to be the only industry, there's no academia involved in that, so. I think this is a better community and it's a wider scope. Um, you know, an STL doesn't, especially with doing the material, it, it sort of overlaps with material um, properties, uh, you know, that need to be uh, created for virtual heritage. I think that that will help also with 3D printing as as far as standards goes. I actually have a slight different, I have a branch from your, your future. I think that actually there is gonna be um, 3D printers in the house. I, I think, you know, we have, Food processors that those used to be only in, in you know professional areas, and I think you see a dissemination down in, in, into and trickling down into homes. And I, 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 for me, I think that eventually, when this this technology gets cheap enough, that there'll be one in every home. And then, if you do need a, a an extra part, you can type that in, and you, the, it goes to the uh, you know to the manufacturer, and then it's. It's the manufacturer sends it through in encryption and it gets to your machine and it gives you the part you pay for it, even maybe through the machine. Um, so I, I think that. I've seen that people 3D printing food. Yeah. <laughs> right. So I, I, think, I actually think that there, there's, a, there's a possibility that that can happen. Cool. Thanks. So. In a point of view about an industrial future use of 3D printing, what uh, I'm angry about to what happens today in this field is that uh, in the past we have uh, discussed a lot about uh, machine cutting tool and so on. And uh, um, in other ISO standardization committee, there are people who are very keen on this domain. And today with 3D printing, it gives a, a new uh, fresh air to all this work that was done in the past. And uh, I, I'm I'm totally convinced that uh, 3D printing, okay, it's very trendy, it's nice, it, uh, I would say, gives something tangible to something that was only uh, visual before, so you can touch what you have drawn, what you have designed. So it's very interesting, and uh, I think it will give new tools, new standards, or, or refresh some standards. Be careful, I don't want, I want to keep alive. <laughs> And, <laughs> and uh, I'm sure that uh, Web 3D could bring this, uh, uh, our experience, the Web 3D consortium, the Web 3D community could bring uh, this experience in terms of um, providing avatars, not only for visualization, but also for printing, for perhaps addressing this uh, uh, topic of uh, industrial data, that uh, the model could have different facets, the one to be visualized, the one to be printed, the one to be cut, and uh, of course, uh, perhaps, I'm a bit in advance in the other question, but uh, we talk a lot about Internet of Things, but uh, one of the things could be also the model of a product, a pump, a valve, and uh, in this model, you can find all this information that could help you to address your needs, so I need to publish it, I need to uh, ask to the model, but I need perhaps some time to ask to move a part, to replace a part, and perhaps to print this part.
Yeah, there's a lot of, I mean, a colleague of mine at NIST has a tool to take uh, some of the IFC models and validate them with uh, uh, a parser, and then you can also visualize them with uh, uh, X3D, which is uh, sort of useful just from a uh, validation side. Let's talk about something different. In the, uh, another uh, area where things seem to be going wild is uh, the, the Internet of Things, where everybody is going to uh, have lots of quote unquote home automation, or as I read recently in an article, someone was really looking forward into logging into someone else's house, <laughs> which I think is a different issue. But uh, do you see? Do you see uh, any relation between sort of the Internet of Things and where that's going and 3D and the future of 3D? And whether it's things like, you know, mirror worlds of the objects or that sort of direction. Or you could just say no. You want to start at this end, maybe? Yeah, so it will be the continuation of my previous thoughts. <laughs> so uh, in terms of engineering, yes, the model is, uh, uh, as we can say, uh, a real avatar of the real installation itself. So, uh, for example, in, in my company, we built power plants, and the virtual power plants, the mock-up itself, the model, it's something very valuable during the whole life cycle of uh, a power plant, for example. So, that's why uh, we're totally thinking that uh, uh, a component could have a very uh, accurate uh, virtual avatar in our IT system, so we have to manage all this information during the whole life cycle from the first start of the ID of this component to the last time they will be used in terms of decommissioning, but also in terms of spare replacement and uh, its successor in the system. So um, I would say that Internet of Things is something that uh, uh, will become uh, more and more popular it could help uh, even in your daily life. Uh, if you have a dishwasher, you have some parts. If the dishwasher is able to say, okay, it's this part that is dysfunctioning, it's something interesting. Mm -hmm. You don't have to uh, uh, to call someone to uh, unmount of your stuff and then discover, okay, it's this part. There is a lot of uh, diagnostic, I would say. I'm not sure it's uh, not a French word, but. Uh, <laughs> auto diagnostics that could be done and uh, yeah it, it could work for of course huge system like power plant but it could be uh, in our daily life in something very simple like a dishwasher mm -hmm. sure. so yeah, in addition to what Christophe was talking about with mirror worlds um, I think that 3D offers um, well, what's going to happen with the Internet of Things is we're going to get these billions of devices online and then we have to figure out how to manage them. Now, obviously, there's going to be a lot of automated management, but there's going to be human involved in some uh, part of the chain there. And to be able for us to sort of digest that information, I think 3D offers you know an extra dimension to allow us to visually compress a lot of that information. So more metaphorical displays, et cetera, to be able to sort of allow us to digest and understand that information is going to be important. I think 3D is going to have a big uh, part in that. For example, right now, um, something that's starting to happen, and I'll just take it from the medical field since I know a little bit about that, is we're starting to do a lot of remote monitoring of patients. So, um, you know, if we want to monitor you know, in any one institution or organization, there are going to be hundreds of patients that are being monitored. Now, a lot of those things are going to be monitored um, sort of automatically or automatically. So, uh, and then we'll only get some, um, you know, alerts when something's wrong. But, you know, you're going to have, if you want to sort of leverage, um, leverage your workforce, you're going to want to have these great ratios. So you may have one person sort of keeping track of hundreds of people. So I could see 3D being used uh, to be able to manage those people in a way because if you just use traditional displays, textual displays, or even 2D graphics, it could get really too too busy and too uh, unmanageable. And so to be able to take all these, you know, if you have a lot of things you have to monitor like this with IoT, to be able to use advanced 3D displays to understand that and visually compress the information so that you can cognitively 
you know, new cognitive load to match the, the amount of, of information that's coming in. Uh, well, after sort of these, these several facets being addressed, let, let me actually stress a different one. Um, 3D for the Internet of Things, so we're more talking about entities. And those entities not only have shape, they also have behavior. And uh, I think what we currently see in particularly almost all applications is that uh, you have a high level application dealing with then representations of objects. And somehow the, the, the semantics, which could be tightly coupled to the individual object, sort of what can this object do? What are valid instantiations of such a template? All that information, uh, if, if for editing systems, it's there, but typically that information stays in the user interface. So that's what I refer to this high level. Or you have an application, like Christoph pointed out, that sort of you have a check, uh, or in the medical field, you have higher level logic then sort of going through sort of what is, what is in the green air, what is okay, and what is an alert. Um, it's not the encapsulated entity realizing itself that, that these are alert conditions. It's typically programmed at, at a different level. The same is true for, for industrial applications. If you think of kitchen designers, like, or things like that. So if you, the user interface allows you to pick a microwave up, but by the time it's being stored, it's, it's a set of triangles. And those triangles have lost information that they should be resembling a, a microwave up. So what the operations are, what even trivial things like, so if you have a radiator, is it five ribs, eight ribs, and 15, but not 7.653 ribs? It's simply sort of not possible. So the objects could know about sort of what, what they are capable of doing, what they are allowed to, to, to instantiate of themselves. But this coupling of 3D, because sort of the web 3D, of course, rightfully so, there were lots of problems to be addressed. Uh, we have um, concentrated sort of all of our efforts on the, on, on the 3D, on distributing that information, but not on how we dock to other information at the same level. So typically, we would accept that we are the lower level representation, and then the higher level software levels, algorithmic layers, uh, sort of dealing with that information and then doing something. Uh, Think of object-oriented programming. These objects have sort of core data and they have methods. And um, I, I don't think we are there in, 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 in the way sort of we look at problems. And maybe sort of the internet of things makes this more evident. Yeah, I think it's a great idea. I think I, I was just thinking exactly that what you're describing is sort of the object-oriented methodology of programming, but for uh, 3D objects and having, let's say, objects uh, know the kind of behavior that's valid for them and know information about themselves. Correct. It seems, seems clear, clear for my brain that that's like the only way and, and it has scale. A, and it has a very clear effect on, on, on also on the purely 3D world because currently, uh, what is the, the maximum resolution for an object if we sample that with, with planar facets, i.e. triangles? So just in case you ever get close, we let you drown in, in millions of triangles. But maybe mm -hmm. sort of this, this item remains at the, uh, cl very close to the horizon and will only cover a pixel. So what are all these sort of millions of triangles good for? Now, you, of course, you yeah. can invest clever technique they have server client architectures that are building off trees and whatever, or you could have the object just realizing that sort of the, the, the screen area covered is a pixel, so I only need two triangles to, to approximate my shape. Uh, and it's not the high level logic that has to worry about it, it's the low level that can do that. So there are very close links to, um, uh, to the geometry itself, but extending and reaching out. And maybe this community should have a role in this, yeah, rather than exactly. being the one delivering graphic standard and say, well, the higher level logic, they do what, what is cool or mental. Or at least provide the hooks to be able to do that. Correct. Yeah, yeah. No, that's a really interesting point. Okay. <coughs> <coughs> Nothing. <laughs> that's, that's pretty good. <laughs> I feel that way. We have a question from the audience. Yes. Um, I, I really like the point that you addressed. Um, I hate to well, okay. use the microphone so it can be recorded for eternity. <laughs> no pressure. <laughs> now I'm getting nervous. <laughs> no, I, I really want to know about how 3D standards integrate with other standards. For instance, for me, as, as a little bit of an um, outsider coming from another community, more on the HCI, and I learned a lot about visualization and the with talk, for instance, about cultural heritage. Um, we can see a lot in very great detail. We have amazing scanning technologies. But what about the user experience? What about, it seems to me, I, I would like to interact with some kind with this object, so, but I can't touch them. 
Yeah? They look so nice, but um, how can I interact with them? If it's a um, static object, like a building, okay, I can see it. But what about an object that can move to a certain extent? But it's assembled of several parts. Yeah? Mm -hmm. how, how can I interact? So, or if you scan a book, yeah? how can I turn some pages or something? So it's, I think um, this is even more relevant for the, for the World Wide Web. I have a browser. Uh, I'm used to images, so I can. The only thing I can interact with images is maybe zooming with a mouse. But now I have these 3D standards that really I'm interested to try to interact. Now I can move around, see, experience things. But to which extent has this been covered in the standards? Maybe by interacting with other standards that are there or that might need to be be there to interact. Is there already something? There or who's doing this? Is? No, it's a great question. The, I mean, the whole uh, user interface side is clearly a fruitful area of research. And Nick does have something this time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, great question. Um, it's it's still a, a really difficult thing um, when we think about uh, you know um, in the, the HCI community and 3D user interfaces. Um, there's been a lot of really great work, um, things like progressive selection, um, seven league boots, there's just this huge list of techniques that, you know, creative people, smart people have come up with, implemented and evaluated, um, all different kinds of taxonomies on degrees of freedom. I think the, the 3D user interface community is still working on those things because when we come down to it, really, uh, you know, one of the grad students can't run the other one's demo, and so this is really, <laughs> um, this is really hard <laughs> to make progress that way, um, you know. But and we're all kind of access impaired in in virtual environments. It's very easy to get lost, turned upside down, um, these kinds of things. Um, with with uh, the standard, I think we're in a good spot because. Um, it, you know, as it says, a touch sensor doesn't tell you what clicked it or how it was. You could have reached it with the hand or pointed with a ray cast, but something, an event happens. Um, being able to uh, abstract the, the kinds of the scene graph in such a way, I'm not sure if that's the right place to cut it, um, but, uh, you know, a lot of those techniques kind of aren't ready for standardization in a certain way. But on the other hand, there's stuff we can test and evaluate today. I mean, a 3D uh, on a tablet, uh, just a navigation mode, you know, we can improve some things there. Um, so maybe with some, some limited gesture support. So I don't, I don't know, my personal feeling is um, that those are, are kind of uh, practice that will emerge more as a de facto standard, sort of like the drag and drop thing. I, I think as we work with the, the media more, um, will become easier to uh, understand how to approach it. Um, and something like a fly metaphor might, uh, I think, and walk, those are two that are getting very, you know, there's a lot of acceptance and mostly it's from the young gamers, for example, who are used to interacting a certain way. Um, uh, but yeah, we need to explore those metaphors and uh, more, and build and test, uh, which is an exciting time to time to be in. But that's sort of my feeling. I, I think it's premature to standardize some things uh, like three D user interfaces, um, but we clearly need to move in that direction because the research community is, like I say, you know, it's not reproducible. A lot of the work going on there. Well, if I may add to that, I think the, uh, you, you, you build the bridge by, by actually referring to turning the page. Uh, and the sort of there have been papers, I think, by Ian Witten's group from, from Bicardo in New Zealand uh, 10 years ago, sort of where at the Digital Library Conference they had a paper on, on the, the user interaction, sort of how would you communicate to the system that you want to turn the page rather than clicking and all the ebook readers these days, you, you intuitively know sort of a little bit pressing to the bottom right and it will turn the page. But the page really turned in, in, in the visualization. Mm -hmm. and, and I remember sort of that we had a fairly fierce discussion in the program committee, uh, should this paper be accepted or not? And eventually it was accepted and what was awarded with the best paper award. <laughs> uh, which, which is quite interesting uh, because 
uh, it, it really illustrates the dilemma. So certain things are somehow clear. The building blocks to do it in a, in a computer science community, everybody would look around and say, what's the problem? We have the building blocks, just do it. And then you have these massive users out there and they don't feel the problem is solved. For the 3D world, I think it's really the lack of, of having massive amount of 3D data. Uh, and we, we almost have none of the data you refer to by saying, if, if this 3D object has mo uh, moving parts, like sort of 3D puzzles or things like this, sort of how do you actually define which of those pieces are movable? Um, are, are the, is this all static or is it partly static and partly partly dynamic, sort of which of those things can I change? Um, it, I think it's a nightmare if we consider how do you automatically digitize an object which, which has moving parts and the scanner automatically identifies what's, what's movable and what's not. And you know these nice 3D prints which show sort of they, have, they can be done by 3D printing but they can't be assembled in exactly the same way. So 3D printing opens completely new doors. But Having such a device, and they give it to you, or you give it to me, what a nightmare, and I have to scan it, and automatically the algorithm should realize what kind of movements are possible. Uh, so uh, I think you're really opening a can of worms here where, where no answers are around for, for doing the digitalization. So it's not, not only, quote unquote, the user interface, which is unclear, because we do not have the experience for the data, it's, it's also a lack of the data. Uh, but that will come, which no one. So well, I think I think that we're going to close the panel now because it's time's about up, and we want to give the uh, Web three D contest people enough time to do some actual demos. So let's hear it for our panelists. And I think uh, this is a, a nice follow up to the last point of the panel discussion, talking about data and three D and the lack of a lot of data. So my name, I'm, I'm Mike McCann, I co-chair the Geospatial Working Group of the Web3 Consortium, and we have a memorandum of understanding with the Open Geospatial Consortium. And local cores here represents OGC, I represent Web, Web3D, and we've been working for the last several years in a collaborative fashion to connect up the services that the OGC works on de defining specifications, examples of which would be web map service that a lot of people use, drives a lot of the slippy maps that we see on the internet. Um, and the OGC has been working on a 3D portrayal service, and they recognize that the expertise in our consortium with people who understand 3D graphics, because there is no expertise in OGC for 3D. So it's a perfect collaboration where Web3D Consortium has owns the standard for content delivery to the client, but doesn't do a lot with service protocols. OGC runs the service protocols and helps define them to connect up with massive databases of information. So that's where the 3D content is. Locked away in databases needs to be transformed through a service to client tools. CDGML is another example of uh, one of the standards OGC has developed. So with that, uh, uh, setting the stage for this contest, I'll turn it over to Volker, who will talk about his idea to have a contest to expose these issues. Um, okay. So um, the idea of this, um, say, 3D city streaming or what we call city modeling competition, was mainly that we find it quite difficult in the OGC to say, compare the different development standards in, for web-based um, 3D streaming and rendering. Main, or one reason for this is also that um, they are not typical geospatial models used to compare these different things. And so we came up with the idea to say, we give you a specific set of open data, which is a 3D city model of Rotterdam, which is open data, and it's a massive um, city GML model with several gigabytes of, of data of the city model plus terrain, and ask for um, web-based visualization of this kind of, of data, also to achieve comparable solutions. And we received for this contest nine um, submissions really Great ones, so thanks to all of the um, participants of this um, of this yes, a competition. 
Um, we have only one award to give, so we can't give nine awards, unfortunately. Um, but um, yeah, so we have to, to select one um, first prize. And um, we have a special award to the best students um, submission. So this uh, the solutions we receive in this shows also the variety of possibilities are based on KML and uh, Cesium, Globe, Native WebGL, X3DOM, and others. One was image-based rendering, the so, um, main doing things on the server side, which is also with the, from from um, the specification of the 3D portrait service. Um, the test two components: one is the scene graph delivery, and the other is the image-based delivery. So we think in both directions. Now we have to judge, and so we define several criteria we use to. Do. Um, to evaluate the submissions based on these um, things. It's not only performance, but it's also um, creativity in a use case. Why do we really need this? Um, and, but of course, also loading performance and active um, performance. Um, the rendered data we also ask to not to only have um, city model with the buildings, but also integrate sensor data, for example. Um, of course, interoperability and openness of the solution, that was also um, very, um, say, important part of the uh, judgment. And now, the winner is... Ta -da. So, um, company here, Plex, Hans Reuler, He's here and ready to kill you. <laughs> we give you like so we give you the award now. Please come up to the stage and then we will give the students award and then you have room to show a demo and things that you've done. Okay, thanks. Oh, Would you like to come down?
and uh, then it's Hannes Tarr, the technical overview, and at the end we hopefully will see some demos. We made quite big effort to, <laughs> to get things running here, so hopefully it work. So we are a small company, as you can see, uh, 10 to 15 people. Um, we have two main teams, that is one is 3D and the other is solar, so we started in, uh, to develop solar energy registers and um, we're quite successful with this and um, so Trackback 3D is a new product, started in 2014 and uh, for us as a company it's uh, very um, important that we get this recognition here because like you, we're just sitting in our dark <laughs> offices and working quite long on, on uh, these things and uh, so it means a lot uh, to us that um, we won this uh, prize and um, okay. So the main goals um, have been to develop an easy and performance visualization for large 3D city models. Um, easy is very important because we want to address not only the um, people that uh, work in everyday life with 3D data, but also the people that are new to it, such as normal citizens, to, to make real like uh, um, apps using 3D data for everybody. So important is then also a modern and user interface with responsive design. We want to support mobile devices as far as possible. That's uh, quite a hard job and also depending a lot on hardware for sure, but um, we succeeded in um, making that work quite good. And it's uh, very important us to respect standards because as a small company we cannot uh, set our own standards like bigger ones do. We, um, for, that, for that reason and because we like and <laughs> we respect OGC standards such as CTGML, WMS, and WFS. And uh, as we are coming out of the 3D world, we thought it would be a special feature if it would also be 2D ready, so <laughs> it's possible to display also two-dimensional data uh, using open layers. Um, so you can switch then from a 2D map into a 3D map. Um, and we have an own backend where the uh, customer is uh, able to uh, produce his own maps and make analysis uh, with the data. So it's, um, we want to develop it in the direction of a 3D GIS using browser technology to for display. And uh, yeah, our main goal is to provide uh, customer oriented tools um, for um, our customers, which is the private sector. And so now Hannes will show some uh, technical details about the stuff that is much more interesting to you, I guess. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, so I have a few slides about the general approach and um, the general theme for the next slide is uh, we move from the data, which is complex data, towards a, a presentation of the data, which uh, should be easy uh, for the end user. Um, so um, we start with the data, um, um, you import it into the da database, which is, which is based on PostGIS. Um, and on, we have a data management application based on NeoJungle. So, um, yeah, Mike McCann used the same uh, software stack and it's proven very powerful and also easy to work with. Um, and then, uh, yeah, we have the concept of a depot, and a depot is basically a collection of raw data, and you can import just, um, it's supposed to um, be like a dump for your data. So, you have different depots, and you can dump your city GML data, uh, KM. KML, Colada, object files, we can have importers for this, uh, for the depot. We, depots can contain data from OpenStreetMap and even 2D data like from shape files or GML files and also contain links to uh, WMS servers. So the idea that your whole data, what you have, is contained in, the, in those uh, depots but the end user um, is not aware of these depots. So the, this, uh, the end user has no idea of the depots um, so here is the general approach. On the left side we have the data and the depot, and then uh, step by step uh, the data is converted um, into layers and uh, finally uh, you can construct some views. Um, and finally on the right side is the user, maybe it's a bit uh, too happy, <laughs> but uh, uh, yeah. Um, and basically the user only sees the layers and you can specify in the back end how you would like to com combine your data into a layer. I will um, show this on the next slide. So you have um, layers and you have you we provide certain combinators um, and with these combinators you can um, 
<coughs> yeah, combine your data. And I have three examples. For example, we have um, the buildings. So you can have, if you have multiple depots, LOD1, LOD2, LOD3, so multiple um, detail levels, you, have, you can have a combinator that renders an, uh, a layer and always picks the highest LOD. So that is useful for some clients which have uh, a lot of diverse data. Then, for example, another combinator is you can combine 2D points and a 3D model to create, um, for example, trees. So you have um, 2D files of a lot of tree, uh, tree positions, and you have a tree model, and you can use a combinator to, to generate a layer with trees. And you can also do this with custom symbols. For example, um, you could import OpenStreetMap data from parking spots and then create a 3D model of a parking stop sign and then use this combinator to create a parking spot layer. And another um, example is, for example, power lines. So one customer of us, they requested us to create um, high voltage power lines. So it's an, a project that is planned and they wanted to visualize it first. So um, you can have 2D line strings in the database and a 3D model of the power pole and it will generate um, a power line and in every uh, point of the line there will be a pole and it will also have a power line for the tree and the poles. So it's just an example. So this way you get your data to the, to the layers. So and now we move to the, the client side of the presentation. So the thing that uh, runs in your browser. And this is um, before the streaming, so it's uh, not an actual streaming, but a hierarchical uh, tiling scheme. Um, and it's like uh, the Slippy Maps Convention. So we have a BMS tiled by map proxy, so you all know these Slippy Map tiles. And the same idea is used for the terrain um, and for buildings and other meshes. So um, the uh, advantage uh, by this technique is that um, these are static files, they can be cached, um, they can be served very efficiently, and uh, we have a lot of scalability. For example, regarding the number of users, so if you have um, many users, you can simply scale your servers and do load balancing, and um, then you can easily scale the number of users. And it's also uh, scalable. Uh, it's also possible to scale regarding the area size because the client only requests the data that it sees, and um, so it's agnostic of the area size. Yeah, you might only get a problem with the uh, so, uh, uh, mem memory. So, and the client application then is uh, basically Open Map Globe. Um, uh, yeah, developed by. Um, by Martin, and um, we have um, implemented some um, modifications. For example, we, like I said yesterday, we have a flat Cartesian navigation. So it's not a globe, but we have a flat Cartesian navigation. Then um, um, it has been spoken here about uh, using games as um, yeah, ideas to navigation. So we have two navigation modes, first person mode and car mode that is actually inspired a little bit by games. So in the first person mode, you can walk around in the city, and in the car mode, you can uh, drive around. Um, we implemented instancing, so WebGL instancing. So you can have uh, thousands of trees, for example, displayed on a normal graphic card. Um, yeah, support for a massive number of textured buildings um, with multiple resolutions of textures and also um, a homebrew multi-user server. So basically um, a WebSocket server that exchanges JSON, uh, JSON orientation and position of all uh, players if they are in the first person mode and or in the car mode. And you can actually see a car uh, drive by or a person walk by. And um, yeah, this uh, was an initial idea. Um, so far there was not so, man so much demand from our customers, but I think it's an interesting idea to yeah, to have some idea of uh, a cyberspace or so, but uh, yeah, so far it was not uh, that much requested. So, um, yeah, okay, so one uh, more technical slide. Um, so these layers are, I said the tiles are just JSON and they are basically um, triangle soups. So um, all the semantic information is stripped uh, and we needed to do that to achieve this performance. But then you, um, you might ask how to query now one building for information because you obviously want to do that. 
And the trick is here um, that when you click on your, on your screen, um, it constructs a line from the camera point to the point uh, where you clicked, and sends this line to the PostGIS uh, database, and there is, will be over the um, massive number of buildings um, where it will be a line section calculated, and so it will be possible to click on a building. So um, yeah, that's a little uh, trick we used because we really stripped all uh, the mounting information. And also we have no single buildings anymore in our uh, scene graph, but we collapsed multiple buildings into one and really did a lot of smashing and uh, texture atlases. Yeah. So that was um, about the technical side. So now I start with the demo. Um, yeah, by the way, if you want to write it down, you can check it out yourself when you have better internet at <laughs> 3d.geoplex.de. Uh, there we have three demos uh, where you can um, see all the stuff we do and also um, the demo I will show you now. Where is it? <coughs> so this is the city of Rotterdam, city GML buildings with Stackshot. Um, they used, um, I don't know what to put in English, but they used um, 45 degree uh, aerial imagery for the textures. So they are not uh, as nice and as in other city models, for example Berlin. But um, yeah, you can get an idea of the performance. And you can see, you can really, um, yeah, you can see in the background there is a building with textures, uh, low resolution, of course, but um, they have it. And when you zoom into an area, it loads the high res textures, so you have a seeming, seemingly um, yeah, experience. I can quickly show you the navigation mode. So um, if you zoom in and zoom in and zoom in anymore, uh, even more. Um, at a certain point, you are dragged into the first person mode. And now you are standing on the ground and the navigation changes, so you can uh, look around from this point. And uh, we found that it gives you a completely different ex ex uh, experience from the city model. You can use the cursor keys or uh, WASD for walking around. You can use space to jump. <laughs> so it, uh, it's uh, intuitive. Um, yeah, and uh, yeah, you can. Uh, yeah, this, for example, um, what I mentioned earlier. So this is actually an OpenStreetMap point that we imported from OpenStreetMap, and we created a, a little sign in this Blender. And um, yeah, so they for every every point they use uh, it is using this symbol now. Um, on the left side, you have some layer navigation. I think you uh, might be familiar with this, so I will skip it. We have um, points of interest. Um, yeah, for example, um, you can click on one, it will be zoomed, for example, to the Stadthaus, Stadthuis. Yeah, on the right side we have the toolbox with uh, more, um, more functionality, for example, uh, we have a shadow toolbox for real life shadow. Okay, it's not working. Uh, yeah. Yeah, sorry, uh, it worked earlier, but um, probably, I don't know. So you can have uh, real life shadows. I don't want to reload the page now <laughs> because we have to wait 20 minutes or so. Um, okay, I can quickly show you, for example, the water toolbox. This is a very naive flood uh, water, uh, which is basically a plane that you scale, can scale up and down. So, um, yeah, you have, uh, yeah, this uh, is Rotterdam if you would flood it. Uh, you can choose different textures, but uh, yeah, the, the water shader is not very advanced, so it's basically a texture with some uh, warping of the image coordinates. But uh, as we've seen yesterday, uh, for example, with the, the Yacht uh, demo, it was very nice water, <laughs> so uh, yeah, we are looking forward to improve it too. And you can scale now the height of the water. Yeah, it's basically a toy. So um, even when uh, we showed Rheinland Files yesterday, um, the people use this to uh, flood the whole uh, um, hills and you have suddenly had islands. Mm -hmm. And uh, we uh, didn't thought anyone would take this seriously, but uh, they decided to leave it in just to play around. But we are um, currently developing um, s um, scientifically based flat um, displays, so there are flat models from um, 
different types of uh, flood that is uh, really um, uh, calculated and uh, it's there in the, the, the cities have this data and we are we will uh, display <coughs> this data too. So it will be actually a uh, useful install a, a toy. Yeah, we have a um, clapperboard so you can make a some, this is support, uh, this will be a scene editor so you can uh, record short movies with the editor. I will, uh, I will deactivate the water. Yeah, we have a coordinates display. Uh, we have uh, some functionality to measure, so you can measure points or lines. <coughs> so you can draw on the terrain, and um, yeah, it will display the distance. And uh, I think the uh, most important feature, especially for this web community, is this button here. This is share the link, and if you click on it, uh, you have a link uh, to your current view. So uh, you can use this link to uh, send it to someone else and um, tell him to look at this building. And this even works with the first person mode. So you could go into the first person mode and send someone the link, and they will start at this position in the first person mode, and uh, they would see you. Um, standing there. Yeah, so um, just to give an overview, it is uh, yeah, very uh, performant and um, the loading time is also acceptable, I guess. And um, yeah, this is basically our uh, Rotterdam demo. And um, yeah, if you have any questions, go ahead. I will in the background do a live, um, our new project, we use the open data from Berlin and displayed it. So you can ask questions, and in the background, <laughs> it, I will try to load. I, I don't think it will work, but uh, yeah, we will see. So, uh, any questions? Yeah. Well, is there a moderator? Here? I was just going to add some city life, like the traffic and pedestrians. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, about this uh, multi-user server, there is the idea that not only the people can see each other, but there are engines <coughs> like a bus that just um, drives through the streets and on the actual bus lines. And yeah, so that was definitely an idea that we are looking at. We okay. needed to. So I um, visualized uh, one time um, how much area one texture took in this original model, yeah. and it spawned over many kilometers. Yeah. So we um, implemented a technique that would um, yeah, rip the textures apart and rearrange them in a new texture. Oh, pretty cool. Yeah. All right, super. Well, let's uh, congratulate the winners again. Is our private player that usually is our work, which is described in this title of this slide that's working with semantic 3D digital models over the web. And the 3D web is based on client on the 3D city database for city GML. And this is this work is joint work of us, supervised by our boss, Professor Thomas Kober. And um, at the beginning, I would like to introduce the background and the conceptual part of this web client, and then and then will give you a very, some interesting demos. So, I would like to begin with the semantic city vision models. So, everybody knows the city is a very, very complex system for, for example, the housing, sanitation, transportation, utilities, and so on. And if you are looking at the city object, you can see the geometry, you can see the appearance, and so as a human being, you can identify and interpret the city object, but the computer can simulate not. And if you want to use the computer to perform some analysis and simulation <coughs> on the basis of the virtual 3D city model, and the meaningful objects with the spatial as well as the semantic properties are repaired. 
And that's why we, why we need the semantic city models. So in the semantic city models, the object of the urban space are classified into several types, for example, building, vegetation, water, city furniture, and so on. And their spatial as well as their semantic properties will also be described. And the size, the meanings, and the functions of the object are also considered. So all of the features are key for the urban information modeling. And a general modeling approach is needed. So in the year 2008, the OGC International Standard City GML was released. So what is City GML? City GML, first of all, very important, it is a data model. And it is also an exchange format based on GMS, GML format. And it comprises different thematic areas, for example, the building, bridge, tunnels, vegetation, a lot of things. And it can also be modeled in discrete skills and uh, so-called level of details from the LOD0, which refers to the digital terrain models, to LOD4, and with the highest resolution, including the indoor information. So generally speaking, the, the city GML can represent the 3D geometry, 3D topology, semantics, appearance, not only the RGB color, but also the texture information. <coughs> so this is one part of the city GML, the building UM diagram. So today I'm not, I don't want to go into the details of this complex things, but a lot of people have, have a common question. So how to use it? How can I benefit from the city GML for some professional work? For example, the energy calculation, urban planning, facility management, a lot of questions. How to use it? So based on this background, we have a multi-level system architecture developed. What is this? On the first level, this is the normal user. The user can, for example, the housing company. And the bottom level is the information backbone. So the semantic UCD city model can stored, can be stored here in this level, in a central database, um, using the 3D CDDB uh, software suite, and which allows to integrate, store, manage the content of information of the earth, the content of the early information. And based on the semantic UCD city models, the urban analytic toolkit can be used in different application areas, for example, noise propagation, simulation, energy demand calculation, and driving simulation, and so on. And now we have a gap. On one side is the very, very complex semantic city city models and some uh, simulation tools. And on the other side is the normal user. And this user has have normally very little GIS background and uh, nearly fast and nearly no knowledge about what is semantic city city models. And just uh, need a tool which allows to assess the semantic city city models and to perform some simulations and calculations. So, <coughs> for this reason, we have introduced an application level, and this is based on the principle of the app concept. And which is established in the recent years in the context of the smartphones and tablet PC. It means that the uh, application has a very, very limited range of functions, and uh, which is very easy to understand and intuitive to use. So in this application level, we can create an application. And as databases, the arbitrary subset of the semantic UCDC models can be extracted and exported and mapped to a simplified data structure, including spatial and semantic inform and structure information. And uh, a light, light waste uh, calculation engine extracted, extracted from the urban analytic toolkit can also be integrated into the application. And in, in combination with the user interface and the, the analysis of simulations and the calculations and processing of the semantic city city models can be performed is possible in application. So the outstanding feature of this of this architecture is extendable for the further application scenarios and for the further user groups. So in this, in my last slide, I will give you a briefly introduction of the technical implementation of our 
uh, system architecture. And as basis is the, this open source da database, CDDDB, and the semantic 3D models can be stored here. And at first, the visualization model can be exported from the database in the format of the KML and GATF. And then the content information, semantic information, can be exported in a tabular form and uploaded to a cloud service. Um, for example, the Google Docs service. And both the visualization model and the online spreadsheet can be uh, linked by using a logic can be uh, linked using an identifier for each object, city object. And both of the visualization model and the online spreadsheet can be integrated into our web client. And the user can, using this web client, um, interactively uh, explore the 3D visualization model. And the, author the authorized user may have the read and the write access to the cloud spreadsheet. And they can edit and modify the content information. And in the end, the the updated, up to, to dated uh, content information on the online spreadsheet can be imported back into the database. So this is the overview of our workflow. And in the following slides, and my colleague Kanich will give you some interesting demos. Thank you, Ziha, and hello, everyone. Uh, this is a quick uh, demonstration for our application. Actually, we wanted to uh, display a live demo of our application, but because of slow internet connection, we decided to create this video. So this is the initial interface of our web application, uh, web client, uh, in which in the middle we can see the viewer, which is based on Cesium Virtual Globe. And on the left side, we can see there is a panel for displaying the KML network link information. And it also allows to load your own KML file, which can be visualized on this uh, viewer. And on the right hand side, there is a panel which displays the attribute information uh, for a specific uh, building. So here, if I run this video, yeah, we can see that the uh, fully textured uh, 3D buildings, LOD2 buildings of Rotterdam City can be visualized on our viewer. And uh, here, as we can see, uh, we have developed a tiling manager which allows to uh, dynamically load or unload the tiles for a specific building as we hover the mouse. So as we can see, as we move our mouse, the specific uh, tiles according to the vicinity of the camera are loaded and they are unloaded as we go away. And in this way, we can visualize the uh, 3D buildings of the Rotterdam city. So it, it, uh, it improves the uh, performance of the application significantly because of the styling manager. So this is one example of Rotterdam city. And we also created a small video for uh, displaying the other important features of our web client. So here, uh, the first feature is data exploration of large semantic city model. Here we can see we have this LOD1 buildings for New York city which consists of uh, approximately 1 million buildings of LOD1 uh, details. And here, using our tiling manager, uh, these buildings are loaded or unloaded according to the vicinity of the camera. And you can see the performance. And this is the LOD2 buildings without textures for, again, uh, Rotterdam city. And uh, here also, uh, this is a demonstration for the uh, our tiling manager, which loads the buildings uh, as we go, uh, as we hover them off. And another feature is managing rich interaction. So we have developed this uh, highlighting feature in which uh, uh, we, we can uh, move mouse over a specific building and the buildings get highlighted. It provides a rich user interaction to uh, work with building models. And if you click on a specific building, its attribute information uh, can be visualized on the right hand side. So these are the attribute information of that specific building, uh, which are retrieved from the Google spreadsheet. <coughs> And the third feature is interaction with different aggregation labels. So I will just pause a little bit for here. Uh, so, uh, one advantage with working uh, with uh, CityGML is that it allows to store the uh, different level of aggregation hierarchies of a specific building. So for example, a building can have a, a different building parts such as a wall surface or roof surface. And these uh, building parts can have further subparts like a wall surface can have a door or a window. So this application allows to interact with the different uh, build, different parts of the building, the different level of aggregation hierarchies of a specific building. So if we mouse over a specific part, it gets highlighted here. So it 
uh, provides rich user interaction for the higher level of detail. And it also, uh, we can also visualize the uh, building attributes for the specific building. And it also allows to uh, select multiple buildings at one go. So it further, uh, it further helps in uh, performing the query, aggregation queries like sum of energy values or average of uh, energy value. And the last is querying and analysis. So this is an example. For example, we need to find out all the buildings on a minor, on minor road in New York. So we can select the street name and we can perform these queries by attributes and it will highlight all the buildings on this specific minor road. And we have also developed the mechanisms for caching and prefetching according to which the results are computed in the background and as the tiles are loaded it uh, highlights the resultant buildings on the road. So this was the uh, these were the two quick examples of our web client, and this is one example of our Berlin dataset, which is an interactive building uh, retrofitting application. Uh, this application allows the users, uh, the stakeholders from housing companies, energy planning, or city administration, as well as building owners or tenants, to explore uh, heat energy demands of individual building or a group of buildings. So here on the right hand side, as we can see. We have a building and we can visualize the uh, uh, energy demand values for a specific month of, of that particular building. So it allows to uh, visualize these attributes and further it also allows uh, uh, the ad hoc estimation of these heat energy demand. So uh, it, it, it allows to uh, it modify these parameters on the go. So for example, an energy planner can work with this heat energy demand values and uh, these, uh, the, the immediate recalculation of these energy values can be done and it can be updated on the go uh, using the Google spreadsheet, using this framework. So these were the uh, small uh, quick, quick demonstration of our application and this is a demonstration link uh, which uh, you, you can note down and you can also uh, try uh, this link on your local machines and you can try all the demos, demos for different cities. And uh, uh, these are the links for CityGML and our 3D City database, 3D City DB. And since it is an open source, uh, this is the GitHub repository for uh, 3D City DB. So that's all from our end. Thank you very much. Are there any questions? You guys are students. Great. Let's congratulate the winners again. We have seen in the last days a very rich, densely packed uh, technical paper program. Uh, we have seen um, authors presenting, contributing to many areas of uh, Web 3D research and application. We have seen papers on frameworks, uh, contributions to architectures, architecture proposals. We've seen uh, novel applications. We've seen surveys. We've seen state-of-the-art reports, best practices papers. So it was really a rich, dense program. and. Uh, uh, finding uh, the, the best papers to nominate and to, to distinguish from this program is indeed um, a, a challenging task, but um, of course we want to undertake it in order to distinguish a couple of papers that we found that um, are really forward-looking, that can be inspiring to the whole community, uh, in that they open new areas uh, of further future research, in that they present um, very important contributions and can be exemplary in, in the way that they are presented, in the way that they conduct and present research. I want to give, this is really a challenging task, this selection, and I want to give you a couple of details how we, how we tackle this, this problem. So um, we considered all of the um, accepted full papers 
for the uh, selection process and our main criteria were um, the relevance, of course, of the contributions to Web3D. And particularly, we, we uh, asked the question, um, uh, is the contribution made, is it timely? Uh, does it involve uh, opening of, of future um, prospects for, uh, for other researchers? Is it yeah, leading into interesting directions? Um, criteria for, for the quality of the papers included um, the quality of the presentation of the paper, the text the text uh, presentation, the consideration of uh, the discussion of related work, technical presentations, and um, thoroughness of the discussion done. Um, we considered um, yeah, clarity of the problem analysis, and also um, in how far the paper um, yeah, included also a comparison or evaluation, which is, uh, of course, uh, important. Um, we also considered um, the presentations during the uh, conference days and uh, in fact we uh, formed a best paper selection committee which was uh, composed of uh, uh, the program co-chairs, uh, Jin Ying Jun, uh, Felix Hansa, Luke, myself. Uh, we were uh, assisted and helped by uh, an extended selection committee including Don Bratzman, Niklas Polis and uh, Thanos Malamos and uh, in fact we had um, yeah, quite some uh, interesting um, and uh, in-depth discussions about um, how to, how to uh, uh, proceed with the uh, uh, selection. So what we did um, in the selection process, we formed a short list of uh, yeah, best papers according to the reviews that were received from the uh, IPC. We considered, um, uh, we started with the average scores uh, to come up with a ranking of papers, but then also of course we considered each uh, individual reviews. We took a look whether the reviewers also agree. So um, one criteria was that all of the reviewers basically had a very positive um, comments on, on, the, on, the, on the paper themselves. Uh, so uh, we then arrived at a short list of, um, in, in effect, three papers. And it was really, really um, difficult to, to pick from these uh, three papers uh, the one best paper. Of course, this is a task you, you have to do if you want to arrive at a best paper um, yeah, result. So after intense discussions, we uh, agreed on a uh, ranking uh, from one to three, where, where actually um, uh, we decided to uh, yeah, also yeah, point out the two papers which were in the shortlist but didn't make it to the first place uh, to, to um, uh, award here a honorable mention uh, because we really found that um, these papers are very important and uh, interesting, so we want to distinguish them here as, as well. Okay, so um, now let's uh, start with the honorable mention um, of uh, two works that I want to, um, that we want to uh, distinguish here that um, are from the short list. Um, the first of these honorable mentions is um, uh, fast decompression for web-based view-dependent 3D rendering. Uh, by uh, Federico Poncio and Matteo Della Piani. And, um, <laughs> yeah, so this is uh, an honorable mention, a very nice paper, very clear uh, exposition in the, in the work. It is clearly a technical contribution in um, helping to yeah, uh, make more efficient the distribution of uh, content via the web. And just to quote some of the reviewers' comments, uh, let some of the reviewers uh, speak here. Um, we can we, we see that um, they, the reviewers appraise the originality of incorporation of view-dependent uh, resolution schemes, uh, compression scheme built upon existing components, um, but proposes nice adaptations and smart encoding choices. So careful, carefully engineered approach was was done. Um, reviewers mentioned the robust, scalable, and parallelizable um, nature of the of the work and um, a, a state-of-the-art treatment in the paper. And I would also like to add um, a recognition of the um, yeah, quantitative evaluation that was done in, in order to quantitatively, quantitatively assess performance parameters of the, um, um, of the approach. Yeah, um, the second uh, or equally, um, uh, this equally same uh, honorable mention, uh, this paper goes to a um, uh, work on, um, uh, on on the work of CSS integration model for declarative um, 3D. Um, congratulations to Jan Sutter. <laughs> um, 
very clear and very nice contribution uh, to um, CSS integration model that, that helps uh, make things better, allow better um, yeah, implementations, deliveries uh, of, of content. And just to quote some, some of the reviewers' uh, statements, uh, they uh, saw an exciting piece of work that lays the groundwork for a technical and usable integration of 2D layout uh, web technologies uh, to 3D media. And the implementation model boosts the declarative capabilities of uh, XML 3D by providing support for specific CSS properties. So an important contribution here that we wish to distinguish as a honorable mention. Okay, so now uh, coming to the um, best paper itself. As I, as I mentioned, it was, a, it was not an easy task, but uh, we decided um, to award um, Christoph Walczak and Jakub Flotiski for the <laughs> Congratulations very much for this uh, very nice work um, that was uh, very well and nice uh, presented, which uh, contributes, um, uh, which makes a contribution to the um, problem of yeah, helping users to generate content to edit, author, reuse, create uh, content and scenes by um, semantic annotations of models, by a schema that allows you to more efficiently, more uh, intuitively, more yeah, effectively author content by exploiting semantic relationships, um, presenting a, a nice model to this end, um, and also outlining the um, yeah, improvements that can be done on the, on the generation side. We have innovative methods of attacking the problem of the high cost and difficulty for authoring and editing 3D scenes. It will help with um, managing and authoring in large, growing uh, amounts of data. The proposed technique is quite elegant. I'm still quoting reviewers here. It's able to produce complex synthetic 3D scenes. And uh, um, another reviewer comment was an excellent paper that addressed an important unsolved problem, as I mentioned. So congratulations very much again. And, uh, I would like to thank you very much uh, the selection committee, the program chairs, and uh, uh, the conference chairs for selecting this paper. Um, I, I take it as a great honor and a great distinction, very important. And I would like to thank, uh, on behalf of um, the, both of the authors and also the whole team who stands behind developing the whole system on, uh, of uh, semantic modeling of uh, interactive 3D content, which we believe is an important topic to do to simplify the creation of content because otherwise 3D applications will not be uh, ubiquitous, popular, widespread use on the internet. Thank you very much. So, in order to present the best paper award of Web3D 2015, and um, this award also comes with a graphics board allowed uh, by NVIDIA. And, uh,
conference this year, which was the basis for what we see today. Thank you very much. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, well, we are almost there. I would like to um, take the last few minutes to uh, invite all of the committee, um, uh, organizing committee, the program chairs, tutorial chairs, workshop chairs to come up. General chair, and please, um, our uh, local TEI students, would you please come and join us in the front? Oh, yeah, the whole team, actually, all of you guys. Great. I'd like to get a... So this has been a, a wonderful conference, you know, after 20 years, uh, I think we can, we have a good perspective on what, uh, what makes a good conference, and I want uh, to thank everyone here who helped to, uh, to put it together this year. <laughs> So our organizing team, let's thank them, everyone. So thank you again. I want to just offer a, a small token of our appreciation to uh, Dr. Malmos for his great work um, hosting and, and organizing this conference. It's a small uh, token of appreciation. Uh, I want to thank you. You're here with us. And I hope uh, we'll come back once after some years, perhaps. And also, I'll see you next year. Okay? okay. So, right. I think that's the end. That's the end. No, I'm here. Ah, Anita. Uh, I was at dinner yesterday, and one of the attendees came up to me and said this was the best conference ever. So that's a compliment to you guys. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. That's